skills. So I have hardware, firmware, or software. Doesn't matter to me as long as it has electricity. Uh, so I hack all networks and people, and as in the end, life. This is why I decided to join a hacker space when I knew from Stefan that there's going to be a hacker space, and that's why I started a little startup focusing on penetration testing because I believe that is the only way to do security right for a hacker. Uh, yeah, how does that not work? Cool. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, divided into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about the theory of war games. And the second part, I'm going to talk about a little event that we hosted at the Hacktivity 2010. Uh, well, should we call it Hacker Conference? But it was more like a hacker party or hacker convention. So first of all, uh, I'm going to ask you, who knows what a war game is? Please raise your hand if you know what a war game is. Okay, about 20%. So uh, that's great because I always under or overestimate the audience. Uh, so military and hobby people used it as a verb for conflict simulation. You know, the big uh, guys with the funny heads, uh, they just gathered around the table and put a map on it and started to play with the little uh, figures and try to simulate uh, war situations. Well, there was a movie then in 1983, uh, which was called War Games. And it was, uh, how many of you ever seen the film? OK, cool. Uh, yeah, there was a guy in it, and he uh, tried to find computers using Night. And uh, after that film, you know, it, it was primitive for skin, if, if you can uh, use it that way. After the film, uh, people who already used this technology started to call it war dialing because of the, you know, war gaming. And then actually after it, they started, uh, when the Wi-Fi networks came into wider adoption, they started uh, calling war driving the fact when we go around the city with a car and try to collect access points. And then war biking when it is done by more sportier geeks and war boating when someone lives near the Danube and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The original meaning war game was translated into, well, there's a good definition when there is a server that is uh, specifically set up because they want to, uh, be, uh, want to make people be able to break into it. So the server's sole purpose is that people should break into it, and it's not illegal to break into it. It's just like uh, the city up here. The brief history of war games in Hungary is uh, the following. In 2003, there was the first activity, which was, uh, well, still the same base activity that, that was uh, in this September. So it has a big continuous uh, history. In the next year, there was the first activity with the war game, which was a pretty simple web-based war game, but it was still a war game. And there were like 100 people in some old, uh, you know, these buildings where they usually uh, make congresses and, uh, and uh, dance stuff and other stuff. We just rented one of these and went into there, played war game, and. Yeah, it was a little hacktivity, but with a war game. And in 2008, the hacktivity uh, had already a war game, which uh, we participated in its uh, organization. And uh, we tried to, well, a little bit turning up the level of the, of the actual exercises that people had to make. So, for example, we tried with levels where you actually have to, for example, in order to actually reach some of the uh, levels, you had to crack a web network. Without that, you couldn't even access certain levels. And on the levels, you had to crack some servers. So not only web-based exercises, that was the point. And then in this May, uh, offensive security organized a competition called How Strong Is Your Foo? And around uh, 
Yeah, they say that around 100 people participated at least, and it was it was unlike any other war game before. It was full public; anyone could uh, enter the war game. Uh, it was played through a VPN connection, and it it was it was just better than every other. You had to actually crack the machines to root, and then submit the information that you found on the machines. And we participated. We finished at the third place, and it was great. And it was an, an inspiration that we must create another one like that, just that activity. And in this September, some of you visited us in activity. We organized the first Silent Signal war game, where our company designed a war game for everyone who attended the con attended the conference. Well, uh, still in theory, when you try to design a war game, there are lots of parameters you can, uh, well, either design well or screw up, because all of these uh, have an effect on the war game and thus have an effect on the audience experience. First of all, how many hosts do you want to put into the game? It depends on the available time. So, for example, here people have like one and a half day to, uh, you know, do something with the challenges, but it can be more or less. And also the size of the audience determines this because, uh, you know, not every not every people have the same skill set. Some can do better on uh, Linux boxes. Some others can do better on Windows boxes. So, if you have lots of people, it's better to have more hosts than uh, it would be suggested by the number of people because thus you can make fun for everyone. Also, the platform determines it because if you have a web-only war game and you have funding for one machine, then you can easily do like 10 levels because they are not affecting each other. But if you try to put two uh, hack to root levels on the same machine, they're going to disturb each other. Uh, now that we are the platform, you should also pay attention of selecting the level of poundage, like cracking a web administration interface or get, getting uh, local user access or even local root. Uh, yeah, that's uh, in most cases a matter of uh, budget because hardware costs money. Also, in case of some software, it also costs money. And, well, it's easy to screw up. Uh, the skills of the audience, because if you underestimate it, then people uh, will all get root on the machines in the first hour, then they are going to just say that, okay, it was pretty lame and we didn't have much fun. Or if you overestimate it, then people are just going to stay there watching a login screen and say that, okay, I just, I just don't have any idea how it could even start to break this network. Uh, the last uh, parameter is exploitability, uh, which is something that, uh, that, that can easily get uh, screwed up because it's, it's something that, that, that is worried by many other sub-parameters, I, I won't bother to tell because it, it's, it's trivial to know that, for example, if you have a trivial exploitability, it means that the guy just sees the login screen, copies the text content into Google, and one of the first uh, results is a simple script that does everything for him. So it's, it's okay for beginners, and, you know, for example, if it's not really a security conference, but just some IT conference, it's okay for people. Uh, treasure Hunt is a little bit okay for the second, or it could be... After the ungoogleable level, if we try to sort it in difficulty order, because in treasure hunt, you, for example, I, I tell you a treasure hunt uh, uh, exercise for a war game, there is a zip file which you must download, and to the end, there is another file appended, so the people who download that zip file must check whether there is another file appended to the end of the zip. So, you can say that, yeah, if I know the solution, it's so fucking critical, uh, sorry, trio, but uh, for every other normal people, they just say that, okay, it's not real life scenario. We've never done a penetration testing where uh, someone has appended all their secrets to a zip file, which is downloadable from the main page. 
So it's 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 okay for some people. So so there are people who love these kind of war games, but but it's not okay for everyone. Also, Googleable is the level when you can easily find, for example, an exploit DB. You can find an exploit that's already working. It's uh, yeah, it's a little bit like trivial, but it really needs Googling. Google Plus effort is what I really like when when uh, you can find an exploit that almost works, but you need to adjust certain parameters. Thus, this eliminates the possibility that kiddos who only know how to download the shell script and execute it won't be able to penetrate the security, but still people who love real hacking, I mean, understanding how the system works and then crossing the boundary, they get real fun. And of course, ungoogleable is the level when, for example, you put up an own HTTPD and you provide, for example, the source or the binary and say that, okay, people, here's a custom software. You won't find anything on Google because I wrote it yesterday. So just try to hack it. And I wrote that it's double-edged sword because it can be either really good because people are having fun or people would say that, okay, it's, it's not real life and I don't like C code and I don't like assembly, so go fuck yourself. And now I'm gonna talk about the practice and by that I mean I'm gonna show you uh, how we managed to create the Hacktivity 2010 war game and uh, what our experiences were and uh, I'm going to show some of these uh, mistakes that we made, and by telling you, you have at least a little bit more chance to avoid these mistakes and discover new ones. So this is the play playground of our war game. It's really simple. We have a host, multiple guest VMs, uh, because we like virtualized environments, and then we have access points connected to Aruba devices, uh, via which uh, people can reach the war game system using uh, their laptops. We try to separate war game and CTF because by CTF we meant uh, cl more closed games uh, which you had to enter in advance and we designed it for companies who say that, oh, we are the ethical hackers and we hack everything. So we said that, okay, here's the one time when you can prove that you are better than all the other companies. And the war game was for everyone who attended the conference, so you didn't need to, well, do anything. Uh, you just had to register on the web page. The targets are, as I said, we are chill machines, and uh, the players have one goal, they have to own the machines. Uh, you know, owning is, well, can be done in lots of ways. We have to, as, a, as an organizer, we have to at least uh, sec uh, secure that there is at least one way you can hack this machine because otherwise it's not much fun. You know, you can write a firewall script that blocks all inbound and outbound traffic, but that's not a war game. That's, well, looking at nmap output. Uh, the fact that someone found the game, uh, one of the machines can be proved by showing some evidence which could only be read if he really found the machine. On Unix-like system, it's easy because you just put it in the slash root directory and uh, you know set the appropriate permissions. And on Windows systems, you have the administrator desktop which has the same uh, properties. The problem is that players can share proofs and, for example, start telling each other that, okay, you need this proof to present that you really hacked this machine. So we need to change this in a regular way. And if you want to evade the possibility to sit all day in front of your computer and regularly uh, change these proofs, it should be automated. And it needs to be synchronized with the scoreboard because the scoreboard needs to know that if a player comes and says, okay, I have this proof, then it should be able to check whether it's valid or not, so whether it should accept it or not. Also, the targets are designed to be found, so they will be found, so there must be a way to evade the possibility that some player, for example, decides to write that firewall script I was talking about and 
disrupt all traffic. So others can't even uh, have a chance to fund the machine. So that's why it is a good idea to revert the machine every 30 minutes because 30 minutes is a good compromise because it's short enough that if someone really breaks the machine, then it's going to be okay in uh, at maximum 30 minutes. But it's also long enough that someone won't say that, okay, I was in the middle of hacking and then someone just reverted the machine. So it's a good compromise. Our host machine was a great little uh, hardware. It had eight cores, 20 gigabytes, uh, 12 gigabytes of memory. And we chose uh, VMware Whisper Hypervisor, which is uh, the former free ESXC. Yeah, someone, someone at the marketing department felt that it's better if they call it this way. We chose it because it's free as in free beer and really easy to set up. And well, quite frankly, we all know this one and we know that it works. Uh, we, of course, use other virtualization also, but uh, this uh, VMware product is uh, the best for this kind of uh, usage. Uh, the well-knownness of this product also uh, ensures that there are lots of how-tos on the internet about how to solve this and this and this problems, and it has a really great community around it, despite the fact that some people say that there can be a good community around closed products. The network was uh, built around separate SSIDs, which represented separate uh, VLANs with a simple V uh, on the Aruba network. And the ideal solution for such scenario would be that you have separate VLANs for the machine groups too, so people playing with a CPF wouldn't be able to access war game machines and vice versa. The problem is that uh, we didn't have the time and uh, created a single VLAN and tried layer three separation. So we separated machines on the IP level. And this created the problem that, for example, you can only access, uh, because of firewall rules, the uh, war game machines. But when you hack a war game machine, you are inside the VMware host. So you can use it as a jump off point to hack other PCs which belong to, for example, the CTF game, because there are no separation inside the VMware. Also, this is just one example that a lot can go wrong, because you try to solve the problem with the, with the worst tool. OK, maybe not the worst, but the really, really, really wrong tool. Also, if you try to separate VLANs, there is going to be a big problem. You have to make the scoreboard available, which is often overlooked because you test from one network. Okay, scoreboard is available. Let's go to live. Uh, no, scoreboard should be available to everyone because you don't want to build separate scoreboard scoreboards for everyone because it just doesn't make sense. Okay, so I said that. VMware is easy to automate. There are lots of how-tos. Yeah, there are. I just downloaded the Java code, and it did everything. And OK, well done. And then it's through an exception. Because as it turns out, the VMware is a you know, commercial product. It has a free version. And the free version has a restricted remote interface which causes it to disable any write functionality. So you can read out every single property of the system, but as soon as you try to change one thing, and uh, apparently reverting to a snapshot is, well, considered writing, it says that, okay, it's a restricted version, fuck you, by the, uh, well, commercial one. The solution was that you can enable SSH because, as we all know, the ESXi is simply a hypervisor with a Linux management VM installed in it. And you can enable SSH and use this WIMCMD command, and it has snapshot reversion. One of the pitfalls is that this revert uses an ID, so not the name of the virtual machine, but a numerical identification code. And you just can't read it out from anywhere in the graphical interface. You have to use uh, this VMD command for it. Or if someone else finds it from the audience in the GUI, just tell me. I'm interested. Also, the as, as we later find out, when you try to use the SSH, there can be only one revert per session. I don't know why is there this limitation, but it's, it's really easy to work around, but really problematic to debug when you just see that Okay, the first revert is always working, the second is not. 
Also, the success of revert is really easy to check because it outputs some kind of, uh, well, some say that it's 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 beautiful, but it's really just uh, they just try to create an ASCII art, but it contains the root string, and if it contains it, it's okay. You just revert to the machine, and you can check whether it was successful. What else do we need? So I needed to write a script which does all this revert stuff, and I chose Python because you can import anti-gravity, as we all know, from the XKCD comic, and I use libssh2 because it can also do the reverse stuff, so it just logs into the uh, ASXi and does the stuff, and you can also use the SCP subsystem of the SSH and upload the proof to the machines and problem solve with one single library. I also used MySQL DB for backend, and I stored all the proofs and files there, so uh, both the uh, scoreboard and the script can access it simultaneously, and everything will be in sync. It started from cron every 30 minutes, reverts host, uploads proof, updates rewards, and it's really great. I'm going to open source it as soon as I can get rid of all the crap I just put in there for debug purposes. Uh, yeah. The reward thing is something that you can consider. It's good motivation that the points you can get for pounding the machines are not the same throughout the game, but they are slowly decreasing. You can choose from many functions. I choose uh, linear functions, so by the end of the day, you will get almost zero points, so we try to make those people happy who can hack machines really fast. Also, another problem that arises that in this Python module, the developers created a public key login and, and, write, and wrote even documentation to it, so there are examples on how you should use it, and the implementation has one line through not implemented exceptions. So, yeah, it's, it's not really great, but still. We love by some people. The scoreboard is the, well, it looks like it's the most trivial part of the game. I mean, compared to you have to design virtual machines, you have to design reverse scripts, etc., etc. Yet it's still easy to fuck up, and users will meet with that kind of interface first, so it would, uh, well, really, it can really disrupt gaming experience. It must have access to machines and proofs, otherwise, it can't handle people who are trying to submit their results in it. And it, uh, as I said already, it needs to be reachable from every network, because everyone loves to look at their score and submit proofs. And nevertheless, it needs to be secure. Um, yeah, I, I remember that every war game said that don't attack the scoreboard. Just attacking the scoreboard mm -hmm. will lead to disqualification. Still, there are always elite dudes who disobey the rules and try to hack the scoreboard. Even at Hacktivity, we looked at access logs, and while they were not really creative, but still, uh, it's always good to use some kind of framework which does it all for you, because people will really try to hack it every way. The scoreboard needs to provide registration, login, submission board, and these all look like little problems, and you'll try to make it five minutes before the whole competition starts. I would say that don't do that. Uh, it's bigger than that. Also, there can be little gold play things like creating a separate view for Beamers, because you don't need, for example, a login uh, box for the Beamer version, because you just want to uh, well, create a big scoreboard which everyone could see and thus motivating the people that if I get enough points, I would be shown in a very big font. And also, auto-refresh is really great because this Beamer version will not have a person who is uh, slapping F5 every five minutes, so it's always good to use some kind of auto-refresh mechanism. Here we have a screenshot of our little scoreboard. You can see that we created several uh, modules for looking at so scoreboards, registering, login, and submitting things. Well, it's a template and everyone can use it. We also stole it and yeah, I designed it. And 
at last, the lessons we learned from organizing a war game. I love this slide. First of all, it was really fun organizing it. It was really fun watching people play with it. And even some people said that it was great. And we, for example, when we uh, published how one of the machines could be uh, cracked, and I tried to uh, look for the file name we used in the, in the game, I entered it into Google and there were already one blog post talking about how good the game was and what was your, what was their path of exploitation. Uh, what I said in the beginning, it's, it's a very, very problematic balancing between under and overestimating because both can lead to, well, problems. And I would, I would even say that it's impossible, but, but some people say that, it, that uh, this kind of balance can be found. Well, the offensive security people could do it. We are just learning how to do it, so let's try it. Also, players have a tendency to ignore the rules. So despite the fact that you write that don't attack the scoreboard and don't attack each other, uh, it has to be taken care of, like uh, keeping uh, the necessary firewall rules and watching for people who are trying to perform denial of service attacks and ARP poisoning and other stuff because, well, I don't know whether they just don't read the rules or read it and just ignore it, but still, it happens. Also, as we found out on Hacktivity, network reliability impacts the user experience. So your uh, VMware host can go on 100% availability and everything can go fine. If the network sucks, then people would just say that I couldn't play with the game because it kept dropping me off from the AP. So yeah, that's, that, that's a big problem and you should be uh, prepared for dealing with it. For example, having a backup uh, network and not just providing wireless but wired interface for those who already know that they're, they are not gonna be able to use it. Also, um, it's a little bit technicality, but still running VMware Workstation inside ASXE is, well, not trivial, and we still haven't managed to figure out how we should do it. In the other direction, there are lots of Google results how you should do it, but in this direction, we didn't find it because there was a really great VMware exploit, and we would have built a really great level on it, but we couldn't do it. So, yeah, we like virtualization, but we don't like when recursion is not available. Also, the last uh, little, well, sentence is, Good artists copy, great artists sale. We must thank for all the war game organizers in the world, especially the offensive security team, that we had the ability to copy them. And we are grateful that, well, at least I hope that this cannot be placed under IP laws. And we could copy all of this stuff. And uh, for example, the five fundamental laws uh, which were displayed uh, above the scoreboards were stolen 100% from the offensive security because they were so perfect that we just couldn't make better. So, well, copy still and create a war game. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? Oh, come on. Yeah, uh, we considered KVM, but uh, the problem is that we didn't have that much experience with that. So we use uh, QMU and VirtualBox for uh, personal usage, even in the company. But for maybe next year we're going to use it for this, but till that, ASX is what we know and what we understand, and also the ease of setup. So you can get any kind of machine, and in 10 minutes, you're going to have a running ASX. In KVM, there can be problems with drivers and other stuff. So KVM is OK for us when we know the hardware in advance for like one month. In this case, we got the server like uh, three days before the actual war game, so we didn't want to risk. But yes, KVM is a really good alternative. Uh, 
Well, I, I can tell you a few numbers. Uh, first of all, there were 100 users who actually registered on the web page of this stuff, which would be, well, you could also say that there are lots of people who didn't play in the end with the game, and you could say that there were lots of people who were actually teams registering under one nickname. And also there were around uh, 20, 30 people who actually hacked at least one uh, instance. But in the end, there were only three people who actually got root on any of the machines. Yeah. It's true. It's not a bad idea. Uh, the problem is that, for example, in many cases, uh, if, if you want to uh, include some enterprise product uh, in the war game environment, because the purpose of the war game is to simulate real life scenarios and Real life scenarios are not about everyone is using open source software. And the problem is with that, especially with licensing. So for example, you could create a framework for yourself, but it would be really hard to, to separate it in such a way that you could publish the framework and, and won't have any vendor say that, oh, you are against our agreement in this and this and this point. But for, for example, Linux and BSD servers, it's a really great idea. Uh, like, uh, I suppose that like, every time when you want to demonstrate, uh, for, for example, you have to try to uh, or like some sort of software you like on the code, you need to pass for that for No, I'm not saying that. So, for example, uh, this year there was a level with Oracle stuff. And that was uh, the free version, so we didn't have to actually contact them with it, and we didn't ask for any permission. But if we would create a script that would uh, be able to build uh, machine images with Oracle installed in it, maybe we have we would have legal problems. I won't say that we we in 100% probability we would have problems because I'm not a lawyer, but. I'm afraid of this stuff, so I would consult with a lawyer, but it's maybe we could even build a machine generator just like this one. But because of this uh, script that copies the the um, groups into their places, it's not a big problem because there is nothing special in these images. So the only uh, necessary stuff is to have an SSH running and and have a password for root and this could be easily done for any kind of software distribution even for windows yeah and there's another option so uh uh any many very expensive software are all like like uh it makes sense to contact them and we ask them to use the environment for for example for the Well, yeah, it, it would be great because you would find a real life environment because there are lots of features which are not enabled in the free versions, but they are exploitable. So, for example, uh, even in web software, there are lots of uh, external modules which make the secure system an unsecure system, and you you can't really simulate it with the free version because it doesn't doesn't contain the vulnerable module. So yes, you're right. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, especially that that would be at the end of the list where I where I you know I presented the exploitability of the level. So yeah, that that's that's the far end and it should not be used. Uh, mainly in in these uh, circumstances, we use bugs where which had exploits on exploit DB, but they were not usable in, in its vanilla state, but you need to modify them a little bit. But still, they were already published. Uh, yeah, yeah, I completely understand. I just tried to say that uh, uh, exploiting absolutely new vulnerabilities is sometimes the first. Well, yeah. <laughs> you may never know. Okay, other questions? My problem Yeah, that's why, for example, at Hacktivity, we just uh, did it because it has, it has become a part of the conference. Yeah. But, uh, for example, Offensive Security did it without any kind of conference. So they just said that from this uh, moment, uh, for uh, 48 hours, you can have this system. So it's possible to do it without conference, but still, conferences are are great because uh, it has a guaranteed uh, audience. While if you try to organize it without a conference, you would find that it's hard to reach uh, all the people who would be interested in it because, you know, these kind of people are, are really hard to reach with standard marketing tools. They don't read spam and it's really hard. So if you're not someone like offensive security, which has kind of reputation that it's easy to reach people for them, then it's really difficult. Uh, the problem is that define average level. So, yeah, I meant to say that. So uh, the average player is, is a hard definition because we have a kind of image about average people and for example before the actual game began we gave access to three people we knew and they were all security experts and we gave access to them the network and they tested it and they all finished so we knew that it's it's uh it's not some uh, task that only we can do because we already knew where to look but also other people could do it, but we try to create uh, the war game that, in a way that for any people, one or two machines are doable in, uh, in the two days of the conference. So it, it would have been nice if someone would broke all five machines. Yeah, I think there was five machines for the war game, but we all know that's impossible, but that's why we created multiple machines because everybody has its own well, key areas where he or she are better than other areas. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>